Good morning, Walden Church. Welcome back to our fourth time together in our 10-week series on Jesus. We're taking it a step at a time, a story at a time, and hopefully you feel like you're being taken by the hand to come and see Jesus. Our first encounter was with the woman at the well, and we saw a Jesus who was both holy and loving. And on week two, we saw Jesus heal Jairus' daughter, and we saw a Jesus who allows himself to be interrupted. And then last week, we met a blind man, and we saw a Jesus who was just and merciful. And to be honest, as diametrically opposed as these things may seem, Jesus is all these things, right? God, God is all of these things. Come and see. Come and see a God who is holy and just and merciful, a God who has time for you, a God who loves you. And to prove all of that, last week we read Jesus' mission statement, and I wanted to go back to it here at the beginning and read it again. The Bible says in Luke that Jesus went to the synagogue and sat down to read the scroll of Isaiah. Jesus reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus says that he comes to set captives free. He gives sight to the blind, and he breaks the chains of the oppressed. Jesus is reading from the book of Isaiah. It's a prophecy found in Isaiah 61. So this morning, I wanted to go back and read another passage from Isaiah, another prophecy, this time from Isaiah chapter 9. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has a light shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You know, last Christmas, we read a lot of these peace verses. Another one is Luke chapter 2. Suddenly, with the angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And we said last Christmas that with Jesus' birth came peace. He wasn't just bringing peace. Peace had already come. Isaiah even calls him the prince of peace. And then his ministry starts, and at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So our Messiah is on point, prince of peace, preaching about peace. And we like those sermons at Christmas. Who doesn't like peace? Isn't, isn't this what we all want? Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And it's a great message. And if I grabbed you by the hand and I said, come and see a Messiah who brings you peace, you'd be all set to go. But just when you have Jesus all figured out, he goes and says something like this. I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you but rather division. From, from now on, in one house there will be five divided, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. What? How is that possible? How can he say that? He came to bring peace. I mean, the angel said so. How can he be also the God of division? He can't be the God of peace and division. Well, maybe it's just an isolated instance. Maybe this was just something he said, you know, one time, and it wasn't something he actually practiced. Was it? John chapter 2 says the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. I don't think I like this, Jesus. 
I mean, where is the Jesus with the sheep on his shoulders? Where is the Jesus who said, let the little children come to me? Where is the Jesus who makes wine at weddings? I mean, he makes a whip? Why a whip? Why zeal? Well, this is a big, important story. And so big that it actually happens two times in Jesus' ministry, once at the beginning of his ministry and once at the end. So maybe before we jump to the why, we need to look at the what. What is going on here? What is make Jesus so upset? Well, we see that Jesus is angry with the money changers. And in all honesty, this story has scared contemporary church leaders so much that some churches in their bylaws, they don't allow people to buy or sell in their lobbies. Because obviously, Jesus doesn't like commerce. (laughs) No, that's not what's going on. No, what is going on is the people coming into the synagogue are being robbed. Jesus doesn't have anything against commerce, but he has a lot to say about theft, especially theft happening in God's house. How is it theft? Well, first, the religious leaders and the temple priests, they wouldn't accept Roman currency in the offering plate. They said it was an abomination to give God money from Rome. But That's how everybody was being paid. So if you wanted a tithe in the temple before going in, you had to change Roman currency into Jewish currency. But of course, there's a charge for that. There's a service fee, there's an upcharge. Nobody's gonna do that for you for free. Jewish shekels were hard to come by and they were rare. So what these money changers would do is they would charge you a fee to change one currency to the next. And the percentage of what they kept for themselves, that fee that they charged, for some people, it could end up being an entire day's pay. So that meant on top of what you already tithed, another full day of pay went to the money changer. That was robbery. Not to mention that when you came into the synagogue, you perhaps brought an animal for sacrifice. Well, who is in charge of inspecting your animal? The priests. And what if after inspecting your animal, they came back and told you that it was an unacceptable sacrifice? Well, that's okay. I can offer you this fine, pre-approved sacrificial animal for just three easy payments of $29.95. So robbery and extortion. Was it corrupt? I mean, maybe it wasn't all that bad. Well, let me put it this way. When the Roman Crassius was governor of Syria, before Jesus was born, he once felt that he didn't receive a proper tribute from the locals. So he took an armed guard into the temple and he made off with their gold. And some historians estimate that he walked out with about $20 million and he didn't even take all of it. So yeah, I'd say the synagogue was stealing and taking advantage of its people. So in steps Jesus. Jesus sees the irreverence of it all and he judges it. King David writes in Psalm 69, for it is for your sake that I have borne reproach and dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. For zeal for your house has consumed me and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. This passage is at the heart of Jesus's anger. The God's word translation says, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. And so it's because of the devotion Jesus has for God's house that he picks up a whip and he defends it. But hold up, I mean, if Jesus is the Prince of Peace, couldn't he have accomplished this same thing but in a peaceful way? Why didn't Jesus do it peacefully? Because when John the Baptist sees him, he points him out to his disciples and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it seems to me that a Lamb of God would act a little differently. You know, the way Jesus drives them out, the fact that he uses a whip, the things he says, he sounds angry. Does God get angry? Yes, Jesus gets angry. Look at Mark chapter 3. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus 
to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do a good deed or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their hearts. So again, the Bible says that Jesus is angry with the religious leaders. Why is he angry this time? Because he asked them a direct question about showing compassion and showing mercy. And again, these guys are so hung up on their own man-made laws that they ignore the suffering of their people. And they knew that if they answered Jesus, it would expose their selfishness. And so they didn't say anything. And Jesus is angry because of their hardened hearts. Yes, Jesus is angry. He is zealous. He takes action. And that's because while he is the Lamb of God, he is also the Lion of Judah. Revelation 5 says, Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. If I were to take you by the hand, and I said, come and see Jesus, I would take you to a Messiah who was both a lamb and a lion. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, C.S. Lewis writes about a conversation between Mr. Beaver and Susan about taking her to see Aslan the king. Mr. Beaver says, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. See, here's the thing about God. We can't ever forget that he is God. Everything has a certain level of power and needs to be respected. You, you can't ever grow comfortable with danger. If you're a snake owner or you own exotic wild cats, you can't ever let your guard down and think, oh, it's my pet and my pet loves me. Even cute parrots, even cats will scratch you when they get mad. If you're a motorcycle owner, same thing. It's not a toy. It's a powerful engine with a seat. And as a motorcycle owner, they would tell you, it's not a manner of if, if you will lay your bike down, it's when you will lay your bike down. And what about gun owners? No different. Anytime there's an accidental shooting, somewhere the level of respect was relaxed. Safety protocols were compromised. And see, our problem is we get too complacent with God. Buddy Christ is a parody, religious icon, and Catholic Church marketing tool created by filmmaker Kevin Smith. And it first appeared in Smith's 1999 film, Dogma. And in the film, Buddy is part of this campaign to renew the image of the Catholic Church. Yeah, no. We can't treat God with flippancy. Why is Jesus angry? This is why. He's not mad that people are buying Christian CDs in the church lobby, or even that that little girl is selling Girl Scout cookies. No, he's angry because the people who work just outside the temple and even those who work inside of it, people who should be respecting his kingdom. They're acting more like the mob and less like the church. They've relaxed. They've gone soft. And they think, well, God doesn't care. He's way up there in the sky. He doesn't see what we're doing down here. He's okay with this. He doesn't mind if we break a little rule here and there, right? Listen. God will always be God. First Chronicle says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Yeah, but God's far away. And you don't always see his greatness and power, and so you'll have to excuse us if we get a little rowdy down here uh, every now and then. Romans says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world 
in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. God is God, and we can't stop worshiping him for who he is. We can't stop respecting him. We can't relax on reverence. Yes, Jesus is the lamb, but he's also the lion, and a lion doesn't lay down in the presence of his enemy. Wait, 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 hold up. Are you saying that we can be God's enemy? I mean, God is love, right? Absolutely. But the enemy can sometimes be the thing that's holding us in chains. The enemy is the darkness that we walk in. And so, listen, anything that inhibits us from his love and anything that prevents us from worshiping, the lion is going to attack. Why does Jesus get angry? He gets angry to expose the things that we seek after when we don't seek him first. And, we, and he won't stand idly by. He's not going to allow us to worship something more than him. Another verse from Isaiah says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Beside me, there is no God. So how can Jesus be both peacemaker and chain breaker? How can Jesus be both lion and lamb? Well, it all boils down to how we define peace. If you joined us at Christmas time, we said that peace is the restoration of the relationship. Peace is how we get reconciled between us and God. True shalom is a vertical peace. And so peace can only take place as long as nothing stands between you and God. Ephesians 2 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. This is why Jesus died on the cross. Because at that time, death was the thing that stood between you and God. And that death was the death that sin brought. So the lion went to war. The lion went to war against sin and death. Why? To bring you peace. Hey, have you looked out your window lately? <laughs> Where has our Texas sun been? Can you believe this Thursday it's supposed to reach temperatures of 76? Bring it on, right? What's it been like without the sun? It's not good, is it? In fact, in the Revelation study we've been doing on YouTube, one of the things God does in the last days is he removes the sun. And just that one act sets off a chain reaction that kills the earth. Because without the sun's rays, all photosynthesis on earth stops. All plants die. And eventually, all animals that rely on plants, they die, including humans. No sun, no bueno. Well, what about the moon? Isn't the moon also a source of light? No, the moon only reflects the sun. Without the sun, there is no life. We need access to the sun. So anything that would come between us and life is bad. And it's no different with God. Isaiah 59 says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Sin separates us from the source of love. Sin is a spiritual eclipse on your connection with God. So knowing that, what would a true peacemaker do? He would bring a sword and a whip and remove any boundary between you and God. So having that piece of knowledge, having that floating around inside your head, let's read an another story. Let's read another story, another encounter with Jesus. Mark chapter 10. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go, sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, 
follow me. And disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, I've heard this passage get preached as a lesson about money and even about tithing. And I'm sure I've done the same. But I don't think that this is what this story is about. Here is another child of God reaching out to Jesus for help. And he knows that he needs help because that's why he comes to Jesus. Something's weighing on his heart and he's concerned about his salvation. So he comes to Jesus with a question. You know, when something's weighing on your mind and, and you have a choice coming up and you don't know what you should do and you, you keep bringing it up with other people and you hope someone might convince you otherwise. <laughs> but what happens? Jesus confirms his fear. His wealth was standing in the way of his worship. So the lion attacks it. And the rich young ruler says, Rabbi, I do not have peace in my heart. I'm worried about eternity. Am I doing enough? And the prince of peace says, almost. Just one more thing. Remove the obstacle of wealth from your life because you love it more than God. And what happened? Jesus made a whip and he sought to drive out the very thing that was holding this man's love for God in chains. I mean, think back to our first study, the woman at the well. Why was Jesus so direct with her about her sin? Because he was fighting for her salvation and he wanted to cut through all those things that was keeping her from being close to God. The woman at the well didn't have peace in her life and the Lion of Judah went right for the source. And if I took you by the hand and I led you and I said, come and see Jesus, I would take you to a Messiah who is both a peacemaker and a chain breaker, a lion and a lamb. Let's go back to the Christmas verse. We like that, we like Christmas. <laughs> Jesus brings peace, right? And there's a caveat, though, there that we sometimes miss. Luke 2 says that with the angels, they were praising God. They said, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Peace is among who? With whom he is pleased. Was Jesus pleased with the temple? No. I mean, he loves us, right? Yes, he loves us. Of course, of course. God loves us unconditionally. Isaiah 54 says, For the mountains may depart and the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. But can a parent both love their child and be displeased? Of course. So, what should we be doing? Well, remember I said some of this lion and lamb imagery comes from the book of Revelation, and we've been doing that study lately. So I wanted to close this with a passage from Revelation. John has a vision of heaven. He has a vision of the afterlife. He has a vision of the end of times, and it's his revelation, and he writes, in Revelation chapter 5, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voices of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. What do we see in heaven? Worship. Worship. Worship Him. Psalm 29, 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory to His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Authentic worship was at the center of why Jesus was angry in our stories today. People get too relaxed. Worship is an old English term that combines the words worth and honor. 
even in heaven, right? Even in heaven, they worship Jesus. They see him every day. They don't relax. So how can we? Isaiah 12 says, Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. We don't just worship him at church. We should be worshiping him at home. We should be worshiping at work. We should be worshiping on spring break. We should worship, we should shout, we should sing and clap and dance and sit in silence and we should cry. We should lift up our hands. We should give. We should hear. We should receive the word. We should obey the word. Worship him through love and love him more than anyone. Just, so, just like you would love your spouse, but even greater. Pursue him, learn about him, adore him. Ask God to give you a holy desire for him. Let your passion for God drive away every other earthly pursuit in your life. Worship him through trust. Abandon all the faith that you have in yourself. Abandon all the faith you have in religion, your service or your good works, and just trust him. Trust him alone for your salvation and not works. Everything was given to you on the cross. And if you are trusting him for heaven, trust him for everything. In fact, just like Jesus tells the rich young ruler, give it all away. No, not your money, your life. The very nature of Christ compels us to give everything we have for his kingdom and his glory. Romans 12 says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Jesus gets mad in the temple because at the heart of it all, there was no worship. Jesus tells the rich young ruler, you're almost there, but there's still one thing holding you back from authentic worship. The woman at the well, Jesus, she, she asks him and she says, where should I worship? Should I worship here or should I worship there? And Jesus says, everywhere. Even before he was a man, even before he preached a single word, when the wise men at Christmas come and see the baby in the manger, what is the very first thing we see them do? Worship. Do you worship God? Or do you just attend church? Don't just attend church. Don't just show up and think this checks a box for God and he's okay. Because we often talk about Sunday mornings as, as going to church. But that's just a building. On Sunday mornings, we come to worship. My hope is that on Sunday mornings, when we gather together, we come wanting and willing to have worship. Sadly, church becomes just like everything else in my life. It's all about me. It's all about my experience. We become a me-first society, not a God-first society. If I'm not being entertained, I'm not happy. If they don't sing my favorite songs, I'm not happy. If I wasn't greeted at the door, I'm not happy. Someone's sitting in my seat, I'm not happy. But this isn't our house. And when Jesus saw selfishness in his house, that's when he got angry. So we walk away on Sunday morning and we say, I'm not getting fed. Others will leave a church. They'll just go to another one. They hope for a better experience. And yet, that is not the purpose of worship. If you're trying to get before you give, you're doing it backwards. You know that old saying, it's better to give than to receive? It's true. Because when we have really given ourselves wholly to God, then we'll walk out of here received everything holy from God. Church doesn't feed you. God feeds you. Church doesn't inspire you. God inspires you. And he compels you to grow and change and become more and more like his son. God doesn't care if we sell things in the lobby. But he does care if you walk in here and you think that all of this is about you. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. There is great power 
in worshiping God. And if we want to see a breakthrough in our life and in the lives of others, then this is the time to enter into the most deepest level of worship, not just at church, but also at home. Worship is the only way that you can enter in to the throne room as we pray and sing for victory in every area of our life. Because when you and I come boldly into God's throne in worship, he gives us the plans for our lives. He knows what he's doing here on earth and he can make sense of the things that are happening here and he can show us the way through those challenges and there is no way that we can walk in his peace and power and perfect plan without a lifestyle of worship. Come and see. Come and worship the lion and the lamb. Pray with me. Lord, even now, we realize that churches all over have been closed and there has been the question of where can we worship? How can we worship? What does worship look like? Do we still pass an offering plate? Do we still print a bulletin? Do we sit shoulder to shoulder or six feet apart? Do we shake hands? Do we use drinking fountains? We're all messed up. And the truth is, none of those questions are relevant because none of them have anything to do with you. This is about you. And I can worship you wholly and authentically anywhere. Even now, from home, listening on the computer or watching on YouTube, I, we can worship. I can sing a worship song to myself as I drive in the car, just as much as I can sing a worship song with all my might standing in church. It's not about where or when, it's about my lifestyle. Because along with worship comes respect and a level of reverence and, and awe and wonder and majesty and glory and all these things should be ascribed to you because you are God. You are God and it's all about you. Church is all about you. But my home life should be all about you. My job should be all about you. My retirement should be all about you. My vacation home should be all about you. This summer should be all about you. Spring break should be all about you. Who I am, where I go, what I say, help it to be a lifestyle of worship. Never letting my guard down, never putting you in a box and thinking that I have you all figured out but always coming into the throne room, singing and praying and thanking you, not just for salvation, but for life and for everything. Because you are our God and we are the people of your pasture. You are the king. You are the lion. You are the lamb. You are my peacemaker. You are my chain breaker. Lord, as I go through this week, help me to be more aware of worship. Help me to be more aware of living in reverence with you and loving you in all I do. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today. I hope that you've had some moments of warmth <laughs> in your life. And uh, of course, this is a recording. It's an audio recording. You can always clip and copy it. You can download it to your personal device and take it with you uh, as you go. Or uh, it's on YouTube and there's a URL. There's an address up at the top. You can click and copy that. Be sure to like this video. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel so that you can see updates from us from time to time. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.